And um, what I'd like you to do is turn to the cover and we can read this together out loud. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And there's some of us who know the verses so well that we'll go on. We will get to that for sure. Uh, in, in book 12 of Homer's epic, The Odyssey, how many of you have been reading that this week? Oh, okay. Oh. Um, Odysseus faces a, a harrowing challenge during his long voyage home from Troy. He's got to negotiate his ship through the Straits of Messina, which is a very narrow inlet, on either side of which loom high, ominous cliffs. And um, hidden in the shadows of the craggy rocks, there are two devouring monsters awaiting to uh, claim their prey. A divine oracle has actually warned him ahead of time of the dangers lurking and made it clear that he will not make this passage without the loss of life. And he has to decide how he's going to handle the, um, the, the circumstances. He, he, he also knows that if he doesn't move through that strait, his other options are really no better and in many ways even worse. So he guides his ship along the perilous walls of the inlet. He loses six crew members to the ravenous six-headed beast, Scylla. And then the rest of his crew uh, eventually battle their way through the danger to safe waters on the other side. That is one of the classic stories of ancient Greek mythology. And it captures from ancient times a theme that all of us know all too well. And it is this, life isn't easy. Scott Peck puts it this way, in the very first sentence, which is the very first paragraph of one of the classic books of the modern era, The Road Less Traveled. He says, he puts it simply, life is difficult, period. And we know that to be true. We don't want it to be true. We like to pretend that life is really supposed to be easy, that things are supposed to be smooth sailing, level ground, everything's supposed to go well, and when things don't go well, that seems to us to be the exception. And we cry out, we shake our fists, it doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem right, but life continues to teach us that life is difficult, that the smooth sailing are in some ways the exceptional days, weeks, and hours. That in one sense, life is a constant presentation of challenges. And part of what it means to grow up is to accept this reality, waste less energy fretting over what we cannot change, and focus our attention on the grand adventure of how we navigate life's difficulties as things come. Um, we also know that life is not always fair. We know that there are options sometimes that confront us that are neither one of them optimal. That there are realities we must face in the course of navigating life where pain and suffering come, and sometimes that pain and that suffering can be excruciating, almost unbearable. A diagnosis comes, and we've got to deal with what that means. A relationship falls under the shadow of uncertainty, and and even at times, despite our best efforts, comes to an end. A promising path in a career is suddenly cut short and we find ourselves feeling like we don't have any options. 
These are the strains and the challenges and the griefs that we bear. And um, it does raise questions. Psalm 23 offers a response to us in the midst of all of this. Says the psalmist, David, even in these times, God can be counted on to sustain us. Isn't that what this text says? That in every circumstance, God is with us. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. No time of testing has overtaken us, but such as is common to humanity. And God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tested beyond our capacities, but will, with the time of testing, provide a way through it so that we may be able to endure. Those words from Paul point us back to Psalm 23, where we have this reassurance that as we step into the darkness of our griefs, God stands beside us with a steady, helping hand. We know that uh, looking at these psalms, um, we are drawn into the pastoral world of sheep and shepherding. And it affords us an opportunity to more deeply appreciate the significance of what David is saying in this verse. Uh, It's interesting to note, and and we know if if we've seen any pictures of um, the Holy Land, that it is a, a rocky and unfriendly terrain. Much of it is. Um, and we, we know that for shepherds and sheep, moving across wilderness spaces, across sometimes difficult terrain, those journeys were fraught with peril. The land itself could be harsh. The weather could turn on a dime and confront a person with difficulties and endanger the entire flock. There were also wild beasts that weren't out uh, for picnics, vegetarian only. They were called carnivores for a reason. And the sheep were their prey. And along with that, if that weren't enough, people of malevolent spirit looked at the vulnerabilities of those spaces as opportunities to claim what was not there. Thieves were sometimes waiting around corners to do their dastardly deeds. Those are the contexts within which a shepherd must steward the care of a flock. And those images are helpful. Uh, as we contemplate what David is saying here, because he knew through his own experience this life. You know, there's also this about that terrain. There were these ravines. And I actually learned, having never been there, I had to read about it. Um, There actually is a place that is known now and has been for millennia as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Perhaps it had got its name from the psalm. I don't know. Is there anybody here who's been there, by the way? Okay. Been to the Holy Land, and, and you've been to the valley? The dis- no. Okay. No, didn't want to overpromise there. Okay. But, but the uh, description of that ravine is that it narrows between cliffs that rise over 1,000 feet on either side, and in some spaces it is no wider than 100 feet across and the entire flock must move through that with uncertainty about what's beyond and the depth of that ravine is such that there's only a narrow time during the day when there's any sunlight at all it's all cast under shadow for most of the day imagine moving through that space during that time That's what uh, the psalmist is here talking about when he talks about the valley of deep darkness or of death. The word there can be translated as death as it is in the King James and some other translations. But it can also be translated as a valley of deep darkness. Let me ask you a question now. You don't answer it out loud. This is just for you. Can you call to your mind 
some valley of deep darkness in your own life? Can you call into your mind some valley of deep darkness in the life of those you love? As Priscilla and I this morning do thinking about a dear friend who's just lost his mother. Those are the places of deep darkness, of grief. Perhaps um, a job has gone by the wayside. Perhaps you were looking at your checkbook yesterday and you simply don't know how you're going to make ends meet between now and the end of the month. It may be that you have borne a loss of someone dear to you, and the pain of that is sometimes overwhelming. It may be a relationship that had so much promise, but it's now gone. Those are the places where the question about where God is come home so profoundly. And let's be honest about it. This morning as we gather, it's not just about our personal challenges, our own personal crises, our own personal griefs. It's about a world that suffers. A world this morning that is hurting. Children and parents separated from each other. Dangerous people at work in the world undermining the security of the neighborhoods, of the villages and towns and cities of our nation and beyond of people young and old who are gripped in the jaws of a crisis this morning and they don't know how they're going to get out of it. We gather for worship this morning in the midst of a world roiling with uncertainty. And the question is a question that people of faith have been asking for a long time. Where is God? Where is God in the midst of these difficulties, these challenges? that I face, that you face, that the world faces. Where is God? And the answer that comes resoundingly, echoing across time with stories that come before us, both ancient and personal and now, is the whispered voice of the one who comes to say, I am here. I will not fail you or forsake you. I think it's telling as you look at this verse and you know, look at the cover again and look at this verse. Up until this point in Psalm 23, we have, been, um, we have seen David the psalmist talk about God in third person. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me. Lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his sake. That's third person, right? A little grammar this morning. Um, I, I do that in honor of Connie Henry this morning. <laughs> but notice at this point when the need for God's nearness is at its apex. The pronoun shifts, and now it's, you are with me. It becomes even more personal still. And we can lean into the claim of that promise. We can lean into the assurance that God is near with God's love. And God's provision. Look at at what David talks about. The rod and the staff. The the rod was a kind of club that shepherd wears at the waist. And uh, that club can be used for just the kinds of things you might imagine. Some predatory beast or priest comes. uh, A priest, a thief. Let's talk about a thief this morning and give the the priests a day off. Um, That is a defense tool. The staff, that long hooked instrument, can be used to rescue and to save. And what David says is God stepping into the 
valleys of deepest darkness in our lives is not without resources to step into the circumstances of our lives and change the equation for us. God's strength to defend, God's resourcefulness to take us through is ever present every step of the way. The promise is not that we can with a prayer snap our fingers and be removed from the difficulty. The promise instead is that we can move through the difficulties knowing that God is at our side every step of the way. And we can walk in the confidence that we are not alone. I want to say a word at, at this point because uh, we dare not be overly simplistic about a world that is fraught with danger today. Because um, God's reputation is at stake in what happens in our world. And there are some who've turned their back on the very notion of God because they see human suffering and say, either God is not powerful or God is not love. Um, it's a te terrible test of how we claim faith in the light of those things. And you know what God's ultimate answer is? Jesus. It's Jesus. In Jesus Christ, God steps into the midst of our human experience and takes it all on himself. God's answer to our suffering is to take that suffering into himself and to take it all the way to the cross, to take the worst that life can bring, which is death, to go down into the depths of the deepest of darkness, into the well, the black hole of the end of it all that threatens, and to come out the other side. To come out the other side alive and well. Where is God? On the cross. Where is God alive and well on the other side of the cross? Where is God, the living spirit in our midst and alive within? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the deepest shadows of life, you, the risen Lord, are with me. And your presence doesn't just give me a little warm space in my heart. Your presence is the power in which I live, the life I now claim. Um, we're going to sing a song in a minute. It is well with my soul, and I think it's, um, it's helpful that we know the story behind it. Because the author of, um, of that hymn wrote it at a particularly poignant time in his life. He and his family, his wife and two children, had planned a journey to Europe, but business back in the United States kept him at his duties, and he allowed them to go on ahead, with the plans being that he would catch up with them by um, a, 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 uh, a boat coming in, in uh, days following. His wife and his children got on board the ship to sail across the Atlantic Ocean and a terrible storm kicked up. The boat lost its battle against the waves and the storm. It was capsized and most of those on board died. He got a telegram from England that went along with the terrible, devastating news that made all the papers. It was from his wife saying, I alone survive. He got on the first ship he could to sail across the ocean. And at some point on that journey, the captain of the ship, knowing what he had suffered, pointed to a place and said, this is about the place where the ship went down. And standing there, looking out on the water, the words we're about to sing came into his mind and to his heart. 
when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that uh, we're not playing games when we come to this point in life and death, stress and strain and crisis. This is all too real. And it really is the place where the faith we claim on a Sunday morning gets its most urgent tests. This morning we claim with a shared declaration of our faith that we are persuaded that you are able to keep what you've committed. We rest in the promise that even when we walk through the valley of the darkest shadows, even death itself, you are with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.